Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long interview program where we invite a guest host to interview the author of a new book. This week, Liaquat Ahmed presents in his book, Lords of Finance, The Bankers Who Broke the World, that four of the world's central bankers attempted to rebuild the global economy following World War I, but instead contributed to the economic collapse that led to the Great Depression. Mr. Ahmed profiles the central bankers from England, Germany, France, and the United States and examines their collective fear of inflation, their interest in the gold standard, and their failed plans to stabilize the international economy. Liaquat Ahmed discusses his book with Gerald Tsai, executive Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal. Hi, I'm Jerry Seib. I'm the executive Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal. It's my good fortune to be talking to Yaqub Ahmed, who had the great good fortune himself of writing a book that talks about how the Great Depression came about that's just come out now when we're in the midst of what people think is the greatest economic crisis since that Great Depression. So I guess the obvious starting point is how did you come to write this book and how did you have the great fortune to write it so that it appears just now when it's topic A on everyone's list? Well, this, the answer to the second question is luck, but um, I started it, uh, or I first thought of it in 1999 um, when the Asian crisis hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was then in the investment business, and the uh, emblematic image of that era was that Time magazine cover, mm -hmm. The Committee to Save the World, which had Larry Summers, Alan Greenspan, and Bob Rubin. Two Treasury officials, the Federal Reserve Chairman. Exactly. Um, and I started reading up about past crises, and I discovered there was another committee to save the world. It was then called the most exclusive club in the world. Mm -hmm. Saving the world, it presided over the worst economic collapse. And you, uh, by that committee, you mean the central bankers of the four then most powerful economic countries exactly. in, in, in the world. And you chose to focus on them. Tell us a little about who they are and why they became the focus for you. OK. Um, the central figure was um, a man by the name of Montague Norman. Uh, now, he's, you know, he's unknown now. But he, at the time, he was the most important central banker in the world. Uh, he, was, he had a sort of mystique that Alan Greenspan at mm. his height had. Um, and he was a somewhat unusual man because he was, uh, uh, he was very unbankerly like even though both his grandfathers had been bankers, had been directors of the, um, of the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. uh, one of his grandfathers had been the governor. Uh, he was a sort of odd character. He, would dre he dressed with a, a cape and a floppy hat and a big emerald eye, um, emerald tie ring. Uh, the New York Times called him uh, described him as looking like the chief conspirator out of an Italian opera. <laughs> um, so he was the central figure yeah. and sort of um, was, the, uh, was there throughout uh, the occurrence. The second figure was a great friend of his, Benjamin Strong, mm -hmm. who was the first governor of the New York Federal Reserve. Third figure was Yalma Shuck, Reichs Bank, and the fourth figure... The German Central Bank. Which was, the, yeah, the German Central Bank. And the fourth person was Emile Moreau, head of the Banque de France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really wanted to focus on them for two reasons. One is um, most economic history is written as the history of economies. Uh, I wanted to, draw, um, uh, to write history about people mm -hmm. and key decision makers, in part sort of to turn the spotlight on um, the decision makers leading up to the Great Depression because uh, it's my view, and I think it's the consensus view now, that uh, the Great Depression was the result of major policy mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wanted to, um, I mean, f by focusing on individuals, you're able to capture uh, some of the sort of uncertainty of history as it's being lived. Yeah. Um, and that, that, I think, was a sort of, it was almost a literary device. Now, I want to get to those policy mistakes in a minute, but there's a fifth character who enters your narrative who's also fascinating. Uh, they're all fascinating, which was also your good fortune, I guess. But th this fifth character is Maynard Keynes, uh, a more, more familiar name probably to readers today. Uh, talk a little bit about how he enters the scene and why he's so important in this picture of the economic world of the 1920s and 1930s, even though he 
really didn't have an official position from which he exercised any power. Yeah, he enters the scene in 1919 at the age of 36. Uh, he had been um, an advisor to George at the Paris Peace Conference uh, and thought that the deal that had been, in particular, German reparations, the fine that had been imposed on Germany um, after the First World War, was a tragic mistake. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote this book, uh, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, and it became a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And throughout the 20s, he was a, a sort of gadfly. Um, I occasionally describe him as the Paul Krugman of the era. <laughs> That's a compliment to Paul Krugman. <laughs> and a metaphor everybody will recognize these days. <laughs> right. And he would write these articles, and he had, um, I mean, he wrote brilliantly, uh, but he was also, he had this infallible ability to be right. Mm -hmm. And he was less um, sort of burdened by um, ideological blinkers in the way the central bankers were. Mm -hmm. And he was able to look at the world with a fresh eye and bring this remarkable analytical ability. And by the way, this is Keynes before he invented Keynes in economics. Right. So he, he was actually... Well, Keynesian economics is really the result of the disaster that he failed to head off, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's right. And, and what he was saying was, break out of your straitjackets, think more creatively, and by the way, let's not be tied to the gold standard. Isn't that the crucial, yeah. the, I mean, the crucial he, he, uh, argument of the day? Yeah. He focused on two things. One was reparations was a tragic mistake, and it imposed a, a, a terrible burden on the world, or a fault line, which mm -hmm. was going to which is going to break. And the second was that the gold standard uh, put the world, going back to the gold standard after what had happened during the First World War, when lo all of Europe had run up enormous debts, was putting the world into a straitjacket, right. right. uh, which made it very difficult to cope with all of the overhang of debts after the First World well, War. Well, let's talk a little bit about that first of the, of the giant policy mistakes that you focus on, which really was the, uh, the resolution of the First World War and the decision to impose enormous reparations on Germany. Uh, I, th I think it's interesting to readers today who probably think of the Great Depression, the stock market crash in this country, the Great Depression globally as something that simply emerged out of the ether somehow. You make a very persuasive argument that it really the seeds were sown in the, in the immediate aftermath of the First World War when uh, what looked now to be ridiculous levels of reparations were demanded of Germany and that that set off a whole sequence of events. Talk a little bit about that first big policy mistake that you point to. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the important thing to remember is that 1929 was only 10 years mm -hmm. after the First World War, mm -hmm. you know, which was the most expensive, um, uh, disastrous war in history up to that time. Um, and all of Europe um, basically bankrupted itself during that war. Um, most countries devoted 50% of their GNP to fighting the war. Uh, they did not raise taxes. They basically financed it by borrowing. Mm -hmm. So they all ended up um, the war with you know, debt to GDP le levels of 2, 300, 400% of GDP. Um, and trying to figure out how to pay this, pay for this burden was very difficult. Mm -hmm. In part, they paid for it by inflating the, uh, the debt away. Uh, the, Euro the two allied countries, Britain and France, owed enormous debts to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And in order to finance those debts, they demanded gigantic reparations from Germany. Mm -hmm. And the war debts of the U.S. were intimately tied with reparations to Germany. Uh, the U.S. refused to forgive these debts. Um, Calvin Coolidge famously said, they hired the money, didn't they? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the sort of tragic consequences followed from that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they initially tried to impose a debt uh, of something like $30 billion on a Germany which had a GDP of $12 billion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They which would be in the trillions today. Yeah, which would be like the U.S. having a debt of $45 trillion, which would be crazy. Yeah. They eventually negotiated that down to about uh, to $12 billion. But even then, the Germans thought this was completely unfair, so never wanted to pay. Um, and Europe never, uh, Britain and France never wanted to forgive it, uh, forgive this debt, because they felt obliged to pay a similar debt to mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. for their war.